let's recite our preparation for the word. Let's read together, please. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Lord, may I hear and receive your word today. Amen. There's a question that is most crucial to our life. A question that one must answer very carefully. One does not answer this question carefully or correctly. One simply is not ready to die. Not really equipped to live. The question that affects every area of life. The question is the one that Jesus asked his disciples, according to the account given to us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16 and verse 15, where it is asked, Who do you say that I am? The answer to that question determines one's eternal destiny. Somebody may be thinking, I thought that my eternal destiny was determined by having faith in Jesus Christ. True. But unless you know who Jesus Christ truly is, your faith will probably be in some imaginary Jesus. For your faith to be truly in Jesus, you must truly understand who he is. It's the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses who have a kind of faith in some kind of Jesus. But he's not the Jesus who is revealed to us in Scripture. And it is that kind of faith that we see in the cults of the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses which will not save. Your answer to that question not only affects your eternal destiny, but also how you live in the present. God has opened your eyes to see that Jesus is Lord then he has something to say about whom we marry, about how we relate to our mates, how we <coughs> rear our children. He tells us how to operate our businesses, how to manage our money, how to govern all of our life. If Jesus is the Lord of the universe, then he must be the Lord over every aspect of our lives. Amen. Even beginning with the thought level. And I must add that once you have seen that Jesus truly is the Lord God in human flesh, you will have to come back repeatedly to that crucial question. Who do you say that I am? You remember John the Baptist, that bold prophet who served as the forerunner to Jesus. He had to answer that question. And it was he who proclaimed that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John chapter 1 verse 29. And he went on to explain in the next verse, this is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I. He existed before me. Jesus was six months younger than John. But John affirmed Jesus' pre-existence. John proclaimed in John chapter 1 verse 34, <coughs> I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. John was clear on this crucial question regarding who Jesus was. But later on in 
John's life after he had been imprisoned by Harold. As the months passed, and he was not released. And it seemed like he wasn't going to be released. He began to wonder. He began to allow his mind to reconsider. Am I mistaken if Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and I am his messenger, then why doesn't he open up these prison doors and get me out? Surely John and his disciples were praying fervently for his release, but those prayers were not being answered. <coughs> so according to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 3, John sent his disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the expected one? Or shall we look for someone else? Why this question? Why begin to doubt? His difficult situation, his the difficulty that he was in, caused him to waver for a moment in his belief system. Is Jesus really the Son of God? Jesus sent back a clear, definite answer. In verses 4 through 6 in the 11th chapter of Matthew, go, he says, and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. You see, John would have recognized that Jesus' words show that he was indeed the promised Messiah. The one who feel, fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah chapter 35. So even though John would soon lose his head, it really didn't matter. Because Jesus was truly and is the Son of God. And when you and I find ourselves in prison situations, or oh, it seems as if God isn't answering our prayers. It's essential that you and I are clear about who Jesus really is. You and I will face times when we struggle with hard issues, hard questions. Why does a loving God allow so much suffering in the world, especially with little children? Why does an almighty loving God allow so many people to die with seemingly no opportunity to be saved? There was an occasion when Jesus taught some difficult things himself. He said, according again to John's Gospel, chapter 6, in verse 53 and 54, Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. The scripture tells us that many of his disciples stumbled over those words because they were difficult. They were hard to hear. But Jesus didn't soften his words because people were stumbling over his words. Rather, he asked them in the 61st verse of that same chapter, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. He went on in verse 65 to add, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Amen. And he ends that discourse in verse 66 by simply saying, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. You would think that maybe he would have kind of backed off and softened up, but rather than backing off, Jesus then turned to those who were left to 12, and he asked them, according to verse 67, Who do you? Do you not want to go away? I wonder what we would have said if we had been there. 
You're following Jesus when you come up against some hard words, or hard circumstances, hard situations in life. How do you respond? Are you tempted to turn away, run away? What do you do? How do you process the difficult moments, the challenging circumstances? Peter, then, in our text, in that sixth chapter, he turns back to the critical question, and he answers the Lord in verse 68 and 69, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. If Jesus is indeed the Holy One of God, who have the words of eternal life, then you and I must follow him. Even when he speaks difficult words that we don't like. Even when we find ourselves in challenging situations. This is quite an introduction to a small text. John begins his gospel that we're going to look at this morning in chapter 1. We're going to look at just two verses, verse number 1 and verse number 14. He begins this gospel with no introduction. He doesn't bother to tell us who the author is. There are no greetings that that we find in the Pauline epistle. <clears throat> he hits you right off with the answer to that crucial question. The answer that perhaps you aren't even aware that you have need of. He simply states in John chapter 1, verse number 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then after expounding a little bit on that statement in verses 2 through 13, he comes back to the critical question of who Jesus is, and he sets forth one of the greatest mysteries that our minds can try to comprehend. For the text says in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The eternal word, the almighty creator, took on human flesh and dwelt among us. John writes his gospel to present the glory of this unique person, Jesus Christ. The Word of God says in John the 20th chapter and verse 31, <clears throat> so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. <clears throat> this simple but profound message of our text is centered around this thesis. And the thesis is simply this. Because Jesus Christ is the eternal God in human flesh, we must trust him as Savior, and we must follow him as our Lord. I want us to look at verse number one again, which shows us point number one in our outline, that the word is revealed in eternity as God. The Word is revealed in eternity as God. And John gives us three affirmations in verse number one. He gives us three affirmations that the Word is revealed in eternity as God in verse number one. The first affirmation is simply this, that Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. We just read verse 14, and it makes it clear that the Word became flesh, and the Word is Jesus. In a moment, we will look at the implications of referring to him as the Word, but for now, I want you to simply focus on the statement, in the beginning was the Word. It reminds us of the opening statement of the Bible in Genesis 1 and 1. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Both statements hit us with a force. They don't allow us to debate the existence. They don't allow us to give our opinion. Does God truly exist? Is there a God? It doesn't ask us for our analysis of the, of the beginning of things. It simply hits us in the beginning. God, Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning was the word. Pow, hits you, right, hits you with force. It gives affirmative statement. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, word. John wants us to see that he is writing about the creation that centered around the word. Who is also, according to the third verse of the first chapter, the creator of all things. The statement means that in the beginning of time, before the heavens and the earth existed, before Genesis 1 and 1 came into being, the Word was already existing. Amen. There was never a time when the Word was not. Amen. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around that concept. Sometimes I'm, I'm able to fathom billions of years, even though it's beyond my comprehension to think past a thousand. But how can one fathom eternity without time? You know, time simply was created for us as human beings. Time was created for us to know beginning and some end. Everything that we perceive, including the earth, the sun, the universe, has a beginning. But the Word had no beginning. The first affirmation was this. Jesus is eternal. Amen. Jesus is eternal. Amen. Here's the second affirmation. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Of the Trinity. I like the way John continues. He continues, and the conjunction and connecting us to in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Leon Morris, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, he puts emphasis on the preposition with. And I, I, I want for a few seconds just to talk to you about this preposition with. And the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The whole existence of the Word was connected toward the Father. You should understand that this proposition, with, conveys two ideas in relationship with God. It conveys the idea, number one, of what was accomplished, and number two, the relationship that one had. He notes that John repeats this in verse two. Look at verse two again. You look at it and read it to yourself. And do and see that you not see with God. It shows that this is not some casual commitment, but it is one of great importance. For in the first phrase, John establishes the eternal nature of the Word as God. In the second phrase, he shows that the Word existed in the closest possible connection with the Father. It shows that the Word is not some impersonal idea or philosophy, but the Word is a person. Now get this, a person that is distinguishable from God. It's a person. But a person that is distinguishable from God. He is eternal God. Although our finite minds cannot comprehend totally the mystery of the Trinity, Scripture is clear that God is one God who exists in three distinct persons. And each person is fully God, and yet they are not three gods, but one Mystery. First affirmation, Jesus is eternal. Second affirmation, Jesus is the second person 
of the Trinity. Here's the third affirmation. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. The third phrase, and the Word was God. The second phrase used the preposition with, and, and the Word was with God. In accomplishment and in relationship, he was with God. But the third affirmation, and the word was God. Nothing higher than this can be said. All that may be said about God may be fitly joined in that statement. What it says about the word. The statement should not be watered down. John is not merely saying that there is something divine about Jesus. He's not simply saying there is something unique about Jesus. He is simply making the affirmation that Jesus is God. And doing so emphatically as we see from the word order of this <laughs> sentence in the Greek language. If you have an encounter with Jehovah's Witnesses, you will know that they claim that the Greek text in this particular verse, the word was a God, it reads in their Bible. They take the article A and place it before God. And the word was a God. Because they say there is no Greek definite article before God. Every cult who errs in their doctrine they err in regarding to who Jesus Christ is. For Satan knows that if people do not have a biblical view of who Jesus really is, then they have answered the critical question wrongly. And if they do not know the Son, then they will not honor Him as God. And if they do not honor Him as God, then they won't be able to honor the Father. According to John 5 and 23. For you cannot honor the Father if you don't honor the Son. If you don't honor the Son, you cannot honor the Father. So then how does one really answer the Jehovah Witnesses who make a big deal about the article A? It should be the article A there in front of God. First of all, this is the only way in the Greek language to say it. The word was God. No article is needed. The word was God. If John had to put a definite article before God, it would have equated the word totally with God, thus negating the distinction between the word and God the Father. Secondly, without getting too technical, there's a rule made in the Greek language that shows that a definite article only precedes a noun if it's followed by a verb. And they regularly lack the definite article. There's an example of this. Turn it quickly. Or, or you already have it in chapter 1. Look down in verse 49. When Nathaniel proclaims, Rabbi, you are, notice the article, you are the Son of God. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Did somebody decide those three? Yes. Somebody decide those six? Amen. Okay. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now there is an article in front of king. Because there is a noun following that. Which, which precedes a verb. You are the king. You are the son of God. But obviously, Nathaniel isn't saying you are a king, the, the king. Amen. He was proclaiming that Jesus was the king of Israel. A third way we want to respond is that there are many other scriptures that clearly proclaim that Jesus is God. When at the climax of John's gospel in chapter 20, turn a few pages over, chapter 20, verse 28. Chapter 20, verse 28. Thomas, the disciple, sees the risen Christ and he makes a proclamation. The 20th Gospel, verse 28. He says, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses have problems with this statement because they claim that he's simply making an explanation. But that would have been swearing in Jesus' day. Surely Jesus would have rebuked him for 
for saying uh, a swearing word. Instead, Jesus affirmed Thomas's confession. My Lord and my God. Years later on the island of Patmos, the apostle John had a vision regarding the risen Savior, Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, and John falls before him as a dead man, and he said, Jesus says, do not be afraid. What? Because I am the first, and I am the last, and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last and there is no God beside me. In light of what Isaiah says, clearly Jesus was claiming to be the Lord of hosts, the only living and only true God. During this holiday season, make no mistakes about it. The one that we celebrate, the birth that we celebrate, is not some figure in our imagination, some one who's a part of this mystical Christmas story. It is simply the God, the second person in the Trinity, our Lord and our Savior, He is the Lord of hosts. There isn't another Savior. Amen. Amen. There isn't another Jesus. Amen. The one that we celebrate this coming Friday is the Son of God, the Jesus Christ, the King of Israel. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> Don't get that mixed up. Don't allow the philosophers, don't allow the cults tell us otherwise. Amen. Don't substitute a little small article A in there. It doesn't belong there. It's not in the Greek language. It's not in the original language. He is the son, the king. Amen. Not only is Jesus eternal and Jesus is the second person of the Trinity and Jesus is God, letter D, Jesus also, God has spoken through or in Jesus. God has spoken through or in Jesus. John refers to Jesus as being the Word. What does that mean? There have been countless numbers of books written on this subject. But I want to keep it brief and I want to keep it simple. I want you to just consider two things when I talk about Jesus being the Word. Number one, as the Word, Jesus reveals to us what the invisible God is like. Somebody, I heard somebody ask this question on yesterday. The question was asked, when I get to heaven, will I be able to see God? When I get to heaven and I have my new body, will I be able to see God? And the response was, I think, right on. Because the response was simply, there will be no need to see God. Because we will have already seen him and we will have already become acquainted with him. Amen. Because as one is acquainted with Jesus, Amen. as one come in contact with All Jesus, right. one has come in contact Amen. with God. Amen. So there is no need to have a form-fitting God. There is no need to have some kind of contact with God because God is Jesus. Amen. And all that God is and all that is encompassed in God is seen in the work and the words and the manifestation of Jesus. Amen. All right. We celebrate the fact that Jesus Amen. is the image of the invisible God. Amen. Amen. God wrapped himself up in flesh Hallelujah. And came to dwell among us. Yes, Lord. All in Jesus. So, Jesus. That, so, so number one, as the word, when he talks about the word was with God, the word was God, he's talking about he is the revealed, the invisible God. Number two, as the word, Jesus also shows us our responsibility toward God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews 1 and verse 1 and 2 begins, God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the people in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. 
whom he appointed heir, whom he, God, appointed heir. Talking about Jesus of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Through Jesus, God made the worlds. If God has spoken to us and Jesus is his word, then we had better listen to what he's saying mm -hmm. and get an attitude of obedience because when Jesus speaks, God is speaking. Mm -hmm. As John 3 and 36 draws, draws the line, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Not he who believes in church, not he who believes in an organization, not he who goes to church, not he who gives to the poor, but he who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey, he who does not obey the Son will not see life, comma, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now get that, now get that, don't get that, get that. If you have eternal life, you believe in Jesus. But see, if you don't obey the Son, you will not see life, and the wrath of God will abide on you. To ignore God's word to us in Jesus is a serious mistake, saints. Amen. Because Jesus, number one, is the eternal God. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the absolute authoritative word of God. Mm -hmm. And to ignore him, you are ignoring God. And you put yourself in eternal peril. Oh, Jesus. Point number one was simply that the word is revealed in eternity as God. Here's point number two. I want to focus on verse 14. The word revealed in time as God in human flesh. This is what this holiday is all about. It's about the word becoming flesh. John chapter 1 verse 14, one of the most powerful and yet simple scriptures, complex <coughs> scriptures. How can God who is spirit become human flesh? How can the eternal become temporal? How can the unchangeable God take on a human body subject to change? How can the immortal die as the substitute for our sins? How can the man Jesus, whom John clearly saw, also be the eternal creator of the universe? But in spite of the incomprehensible mystery of this, this is what the Bible simply declares. As the angel uh, 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 explained to Mary in Luke chapter 1 verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Now John in, in, in that 14th verse makes four statements. Four statements. Four statements. I want you to take note of four statements. Here's the first one. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word, the Word that was with God, the Word that was in the beginning, the Word that was God, became flesh and dwelt among us. When he uses the word Word, the Word in verse 14, it takes us immediately back to verse number 1, meaning the eternal Word who is God. The eternal one who has no beginning, who has no end. The eternal one who has always been. This eternal one now becomes flesh. Now John could have used a more milder <laughs> term such as he became man. Perhaps John used flesh to counter the false teachings of the occult of his day who denied the true humanity of Jesus. As John attacks in 1 John chapter number 4, verses 2 and 3. They asserted that all matter was evil, which the Bible does not teach. And although Jesus does not share our sinful nature, he is yet completely human. <coughs> Notice the word dwelt. Notice his verb dwelt. He dwelt among us. Literally, in the original language, it means he tabernacled among us. 
He tabernacled among them. So tabernacle in the Old Testament was the earthly picture of God's dwelling place among men. Jesus in his human body was God pitching his tent among men for a brief period of time. He tabernacled. He dwelt among us. First thing that I want you to know is from verse 14 is that Jesus became what flesh? And that he what? Dwelt among us. Here's the second thing. We saw his glory. We saw his glory. Now we have to ask the question, who is we? Now John is writing this gospel some 30 years after Jesus' ascension. So he's reflecting back on what he what he saw, what he experienced. He makes no reckon, he makes no connection with himself in the first person at all to his gospel. You see John always in the third person, unless Jesus refers to him either in the second person or in the first person. When he talked about we, he's talking about the, the disciples and himself. We saw his glory. The disciples saw his glory, God's glory. If you recall, in Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34 and 35 was always associated with the tabernacle. If the tabernacle did not manifest the glory of God, then the people looking upon the tabernacle knew that God's presence was not there. With regard to Jesus, when he performed his first miracle, by the way, what was his first miracle? Turning the water into wine. In John chapter 2, verse 11, it reports that this beginning of his signs did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee. And the text says, manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Because that first, that first miracle demonstrated the validity of who Jesus was. And it shared in their spirit, this is God in me. Because the glory of God, the magnificent, awesome power of God was seen in that first miracle. And the text says they believed, they believed, they believed, they believed. From that point on, they believed in him. John, of course, also saw Jesus' glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Although he does not report this in his gospel, we look in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. Peter, James, and John is going on the Mount of the Mount to pray with Jesus, and there they encounter the magnificent presence of God. And God shows them not only Jesus, but God shows them several other characters. Who else is on the Mount of, of uh, trans Transfiguration? Elijah. Elijah. And Moses. And Moses. Why Elijah? One was to come. He represents the prophets. Why Moses? He represents the law. What is the response of the disciples? Peter said, and Peter immediately wants to do what? Build a tabernacle. Build, a tabernacle. Build three tabernacles. Build three tents. But that wasn't his purpose. That wasn't God's purpose for showing him. As soon as Peter opened up his mouth, he begins to explain, let us build these tabernacles. One for Elijah. One for Moses. One for Jesus. Boom. They're gone. The only person left is Jesus. Amen. Then there's a voice that comes stumbling down to the clouds. This is my son. Yes, this is the only one I want you to be connected with. Yes. Elijah and Moses pointed to him. They spoke in regarding to him. Mm -hmm. But he is here. Amen. They saw that, but they had to, they had to witness who Jesus Christ really was. And, 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 and there is a deeper sense in which you see the manifestation of Jesus' glory on the cross. When Judas, you remember, when Jesus went out to betray him, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. The 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 31. When John and the other disciples saw Jesus willingly offering himself for our sins, they simply saw the glory of God. When he says we saw the glory, John saw him mag magnify the essence of God on several occasions. When he did his miracles on the Mount of Transfiguration and even on the cross. So the word became flesh and did what? It dwelt among us. 
Number two, he says, we saw his glory. glory. And then there's letter C. Jesus' glory was that of the only begotten from the Father. That word only begotten is better translated unique or only one of his kind. The same word is used to refer to Isaac according to Hebrews 11 and 17. He was not Abraham's only son, but he was his unique son. He was simply the son of promise. Only begotten does not refer to Jesus being born of Mary or to his coming into existence at some time in the past, which he did not. Rather, it points to his unique beginnings and his unique relationship to the Father as being the eternal son. He is God's son in a unique way that no one else is and now no one else can be. Amen. That's Jesus. Amen. And then he makes this fourth starting statement in the 14th verse. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Notice that phrase. He was full of grace and truth. Where's his pointing us back? It's pointing us back to the word. John adds these terms here because both are essential for us to understand salvation. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Yes, it is. Shown to those who deserve his judgment. Yes, Lord. If you can earn salvation, then you don't need grace. Right. Amen. Only a sinner needs grace. Right. The only way you can receive God's salvation is to acknowledge your need as a sinner. Yes. Renounce all trust in yourself or on your own merit. And simply trust in the grace of God as shown on the cross of Christ. Amen. Truth points to God's character. Amen. Truth points to God's character. Jesus is absolute truth. By contrast, Satan is an absolute liar. <coughs> He's the father of lies, according to John 4, 8 and 44. As the God of truth, his righteousness calls us to truth. But we have sinned and fallen short of his perfect righteousness. So Jesus claimed in John 14 and 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus embodied the truth and lived in accordance with God's truth. And when he offered himself on the cross as the sinless substitute, he paid the penalty for sin that you and I deserve. Thus he upheld God's truth, yet could at the same time offer grace. But see, we have to respond to God's truth. In other words, we have to respond to Jesus. What have we learned so far? We have learned several things. We have learned, number one, that the word is revealed in eternity as God. Number two, we have learned that the word is revealed in time as God in the flesh. And there's one other point I want us to take from these two verses. Our response to the eternal word made flesh should be to trust him as Savior and follow him simply as Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 regarding those who are perishing, says this. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4. In whose case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Let me read that again. Some of you all just got it. In whose case, the God of this world. Who is the God of this world? Satan. Now, now notice what the text says he has done. He has what? Blinded the minds of the unbelieving. For what reason has he, has he done this? So that they, the unbelieving, might not see what? See the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And notice how he, how he modifies Christ. Who is the image of of God. Unless God opens one's eyes, one will not, cannot see the glory of Christ, who is, according to John's gospel, the eternal word who became flesh. Yes. But Paul continues in that, in that uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, chapter verse 6. 
He says, for God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Christ. When God opened our eyes to see his glory that was in Christ, you and I instantly saw the answer to all of life's problems. And we instantly saw the answer to the most critical question in regarding to who is Jesus Christ. Who is he? He is the eternal word who took on flesh. Who is he? He was with God who took on flesh. Who is he? He was God, is God who took on flesh. And his glory was especially revealed when he died on the cross on our behalf. To satisfy God's wrath. Therefore, you and I must trust him as Savior. And we must follow him as Lord. As we move, as we have already been observing in this season that we call the Christmas season. As we move closer to the date of the actual celebrating of the birth of Christ. Do not lose sight of him being God. Do not lose sight of why he came. Do not lose sight of why God sent him in the earth realm. For what reason? Do not take light of your salvation. Do not take light of your walking, your connectedness with God. You are saved because God gave to us the very best gift he had. How do you answer this crucial question? Have you answered this crucial question? If not, I want you to read through the Gospels and ask God to open your eyes to see the glory of Jesus Christ. See the glory of Jesus Christ through everything. See the glory of Jesus Christ in that Christmas tree you got in your house. Which reminds us of the evergreen. And the evergreen is full of life. When you see the lights in your house and the lights on the tree, it should remind you of Jesus being the light of the world. Yes. When you take notice of all those gifts and presents under that tree, under that green, evergreen tree that represents life, it should remind you that the wise men from the east came and brought to him expensive gifts. That's how you treat a king. Yes. Amen. Amen. When you sit down and sup at the house with the dinner and the turkey and the ham and your family and friends, be reminded that one day we will have supper with Jesus. Everything that we do these coming days should remind us of Jesus. Of Jesus Christ. Don't lose sight. Don't lose sight. Be a messenger. Tell somebody. It's really about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The berries, the howl, the, 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 the mistletoe. It's all about Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It's all right to have all this stuff. It's all right. The Bible doesn't speak about this being a sin, but you need to connect it to Jesus. Amen. <coughs> amen, amen. Recognize that he is God. Yes. He loved us so much he did not want us to be punished forever in hell. So Thank he you, said, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Himself wrapped in flesh. Thank you, Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Yes. Celebrate Jesus. Yes. This holiday season. Mm. Everything in life and eternity rests on the right response to the question Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? I pray this morning that everyone in this room can say that you are simply Lord Jesus. You are the eternal word made flesh, the glory of God, the unique son of the Father, who was simply and is full of grace, who's full of truth for me.